ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Lock and load. It's time for the gun rack with your hosts, Joey and Drew. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gun Racks and Orange Desert Institute School of Firearms Technology's official podcast. I'm Josiah Upper. Folks call me Joey, and today we have one Mr. Andrew Poplin. Mr. Andrew Poplin. You actually were referred to as Mr. Andrew Poplin in a podcast episode, which has not aired by myself, which we're going to get into more later. A little bit of housekeeping stuff first. We're going to play a little bit of catch up today because it has been, I believe, like 25 days since we have published last, assuming it comes out today. If it comes out tomorrow, 26 days. And uh, there are pretty good reasons for that, although we're both kind of bummed that it happened anyway so sorry for the the gap in airtime and we appreciate you guys listening to us again but the first and most important thing and we're going to talk about how it went down a little later but drew poplin mr drew poplin is now a married man air horn noises yeah drew got married um was it november 11th yes was it veterans day itself Yep, it was Veterans Day. It was 11 11 22, which is some nice numerology right there. There you go. Good vibes. Real good vibes. And let me tell you what, people, I had not been to a Friday wedding before. I cannot more heartily recommend them to you, single lads and lasses out there. That stuff is cheaper. And uh, not only does it not super matter to most of your friends and family because a wedding is going to be a whole weekend but if you have a wedding on a friday night your weekend is wide open still selfishly i mean it's it was so nice <laughs> yeah no you party uh you go hard friday night and then you have you still have a full recovery. day to recover. it's all good yeah and then you have football on sunday still good to go but we had a real good time at his wedding but that was the uh, main reason nothing popped out on that week. And then uh, actually the same time, if we had published a week exactly after our last episode, it would have happened in the middle of, of Drew's bachelor get together. So actually next time one of us gets married. Three I said years. that would have been, that would have been pretty cool. Actually. Now yeah. That I think we're going to record that thing that I can't believe we didn't think about that. We're going to do the gun wreck bachelor special, but we can't, because we're both married now. Mm. Um, we're going to get it for, for someone we know. Maybe, you know, no. I can't think of any of our guests that are single on a regular basis. So we'll find we'll figure them. out something. We'll yeah. find them. We'll find them. We'll get <laughs> and, them. And listen, worry about it. You out there and what? Well, I think we said the gun rack mafia. The gun rack mafia. Yes. You gentlemen out there in the gun rack mafia if you have a wedding coming up let us know we can record an episode you'll get to be on the show and uh it'd be nice to uh wish you a wonderful marriage yes and while the initial one was claimed and root beer was given to the person in question that claimed the root beer yes it was right yes we will get another thing of root beer and we will send it to you uh if you come on and and guest star on the gun rack during your bachelor party absolutely that, that is a gun rack promise root beer is truly the drink of all weddings yes i will say the the stuff at your wedding was pretty solid though and i don't know if there was root beer in in that lineup there was not unfortunately that that wedding the so i mean the like beer and wine lineup was solid. The soft drink lineup was the strangest combination of drinks I think I've ever seen. It was all stuff I was really into, but very obscure. Like mm -hmm. it was like cherry Coke and Hawaiian punch. And I think there was lemonade in a can, but I don't remember exactly. It was, it was very specific and strange, but I loved it because I love Hawaiian punch more than anything. I immediately stained my shirt. <laughs> oh no. Uh, I didn't even notice. Because there was one thing I hid it, but I moved my tie over to hide it. There is one thing in this world that stains harder than uh, red wine, and it is freaking Hawaiian punch, people. It will <laughs> ruin your day. 
<laughs> it will steal your inheritance. Listen, if it makes you feel any better, I didn't notice. I mean, I know I was busy, but I mean, yeah. fine. You look good. You were busy. So <laughs> that was week one. Long story short, um, Drew went out and I actually prepped um, an episode for you guys. I don't know if you guys remember. We did a Black Friday special. I think we called it Stocking Stuffers for Firearms Lovers last year. And I talked with Jake Burden about retail during the holiday season from this, you know, gunsmith's perspective and all this. It was really fun. So I thought I'd double it up and go, you know, I curated um, sales and uh, went out there and and did some comparative stuff. Uh, found some stuff in retail stores and was able to find some internet deals that are pretty sweet. Uh, so I record this thing solo um, while Drew is, uh, I think he was traveling for, or getting ready to travel for the holiday weekend. And uh, I uh, edit the thing, which I haven't done in forever, hop on Podbean to publish it, and Podbean locks me out for a full 24 hours, making it completely irrelevant. Yep. Um, so there is a fairly in-depth gun retail episode that's never going to see the light of day because all the deals are done now (laughs) it's just such a way i spent a long time curating that stuff Uh, that was it's pretty annoying so anyway there was a there's a wedding there was an episode that lives in niflheim now and uh there there's this one and then i also had a fairly uh demanding life event that's taken a lot of my time which certainly hasn't helped but we're going to talk about today uh this is a little less formal episode but we're going to end it with the second part of joey's got a brand new gun most recent episode we talked about narrowing firearms down but tell you what i ended up with at the store um so we're still gun centric a little bit so if you don't want to hear about drew and i talking about weddings and uh i'll spoil what i've got coming down the line which is moving um feel free to hop into like the last five ten minutes of this episode (laughs) listen to that part no one's gonna blame you for it we already have your download as uh as as i am fond of saying so the uh if catching up is not your bang catch that last piece of firearms content and then tune in uh next week where we're going to be decidedly more firearm centric we will not judge you but so drew's wedding was pretty sweet what oh first and most importantly would you tell our dear listeners when it was you and your wife wrote your own vows Mm -hmm. when did you write your vow officially yes about an hour before the wedding about an hour before the wedding. And I have it on very specific authority from a, a bridal party member that it was significantly less than an hour before the wedding. So I have conflicting sources on that. <laughs> okay, it was probably about 30 minutes. That's the close. I got 20 minutes. I'll take 30 minutes before the wedding. Rachel, I'm certain, did not do that. She um, did, actually. She, did she? Or at least it was the day of. Yes. Okay, that's fair. Um, that was fun. You ha- you packed it out pretty good. The uh, There was what, 60 or 70 people there? Something like that? Yeah, I think there was like 71. Yeah, dude. Yeah. It was it was a pretty, uh, pretty medium-sized venue. So, so many people. We were like, we were in. It was full. It was really fun. It- you say that, that, that's the secret. You got to get a s- smaller room. And it makes it That's, look like a lot big, more great people. moves, dude. The um, it was a nice spot in a nice little town, uh, not too far from us, and uh, it was really nice. Um, your ceremony was exactly the right length, it was shorter than the one we did, which we probably would redo if we had time later. Tell, tell us about the experience, yeah. So, one reason it the vowels were written so close to the actual ceremony. Drew just um, learned to write. Yeah, so, it's yeah, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Went in the day before, didn't it's know. It was more of to. a literacy flex than anything else. Yes. <laughs> um, no, what happened was 
I had a piece of paper that I was going to write it on. It was a blank piece of paper. Uh, and I accidentally spilled mimosa all over it. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. So yeah, for drinking mimosas, I love a good mimosa. If I've, we can talk about how much alcohol I still have left over from the wedding Dude, later. It lasts. <laughs> we'll see how long it lasts. But so my friend Calvin had to run over to i don't even know where he found it i think it was just like a random little knickknack shop found a notebook or like a um, a nice little you know sketchbook or something bought that gave it to me and then i was also prevented from being inside the venue for about half an hour to 45 minutes nice uh, yeah um the photographer wanted to get pictures of the dress and like kind of all around the different locations. So she's like, well, you know, bride doesn't want you to see the dress. So uh, get out of here. So I was briefly kicked out of my own wedding, which is awesome. Yeah. You know, very proud moment of my life. But no, so the whole wedding itself, I got engaged. If you remember back in April. Yeah. And we had immediately started trying to plan for it. And just because of finances and whatever, essentially we ended up not planning this until a month and a half before our wedding date. Galaxy um, brain moves, dude. Absolutely. So it had been a very stressful about two months just trying to get everything together. You know, you're the payment plans and stuff are not spread out at that point it's sort of just like hey hope you have these lump sums of money just lying around which luckily we were able to pay for the vast majority of it we had some help from some family members so thank you guys for that always nice i thought about doing a uh what was it a uh a telethon or something uh a gun rack telethon <laughs> yeah we oh. have one user call in with like three dollars and we're like Big success. We're so gonna did, where we just hold the content hostage for days. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we kind of ended up doing that <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Oh, that's true. We did. Um, but so the whole lead up to it was super stressful. But the day of was was just so nice. Um, the night before, you know, Joey was actually sort of at my like bachelor hangout thing. And that was nice and chill. The sort of just that week of things just fell into place and the marriage has been awesome. It's been so, so nice. I used to live about two hours away from my now wife. Uh, and so I was constantly having to drive back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So to kind of be settled, it's uh, a really awesome feeling. Uh, although with it being close to Thanksgiving, I'm not entirely sure how many miles I've put on my car, but it is something significant. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah, because we drove down to New Orleans for the honeymoon, drove back, had three, four days at our apartment, and then drove down or drove up to New York for Thanksgiving. And uh, we got back in late last night because oh, traffic geez, was dude. on I-81 South was horrendous uh there was really? like there was like we were put behind solely because of traffic by about three hours yuck yeah we left at like seven in the morning didn't get back till 10 yuck and i-81 is generally where you go to avoid the traffic on the holiday weekends if you're on the east coast 95 is is where you live but 81 supposed to be a little safe spot. The scenic, but no, not anymore. Not this time, dude. People are learning about that one, and I'm not, I'm not happy about it. <laughs> it used to be just me and 8,000 truckers, and I was pretty cool with that. Yeah. Yeah. If you're listening and you're on I 81, get off. It's ours. Yes. Yep. You were here first. Get off. But yeah. Oh, yeah. Speaking of, of travels, by the same token of your wedding vows, what when did you guys officially to preface your follow-up question <laughs> determine where you were going for your honeymoon i was waiting for that um <laughs> we 
determined the destination and dates and all the plans for the honeymoon literally during the bachelor party uh yeah. the night before less than 24 hours before before the the dance the big dance yeah, i tell you what though that my parents timeshare came in the clutch although we didn't get to <laughs> we didn't get to new orleans until like 11 30 you know 12 o'clock in the morning so that was an interesting experience walking through walking down canal street and a little bit of bourbon street uh in the middle of the night yeah i've actually done that believe it or not by my lone self and Um, you didn't tell me how bad parking in that city is it's horrific um and there are parts of new orleans that are there's not even parts there were enormous quantities of new orleans that are pretty rough i do the um I take the, my parents used to live in Arizona and uh, I live on the East coast. So I used to take the train out there because I don't really fly thanks to a fun medical condition, but um, there's an overnight in New Orleans and the train station is not in the best part of no. New Orleans. <laughs> so I have gone, I stayed at a hostel once, which is not on brand for me really. And I uh, went to a holiday in once and it is, um, in the dead of night, because that stuff always, you know, you get dropped mm-hmm. off. I think we got dropped off at 1 a.m. one time. And uh, it's it's pretty wild. It's weird. Yeah. I could never live there. Yeah. Did you call like a taxi or like an Uber or anything? I called an Uber once. And I think I ended up calling him both times. And I walked part of the way and was like, this is, I, I got turned around. And I was like, I'm not playing this game. And there was an Uber mm-hmm. that was like two minutes away i was like okay we're i won't pay 10 bucks to go the next you know three quarters of a mile or whatever it's worth um, it if, if you've never walked through new orleans uh yeah, at that to have someone drive you if you especially, can especially if you're like just standing there with your bags like we had to walk from the parking garage with like all of our luggage and stuff yeah to the hotel it was madness but i actually enjoyed new orleans a lot crazy Definitely want to live there. Uh, no, I, but I do want a vacation there sometime for real. Because that mm-hmm. did you have a Sazerac? Oh, uh, excuse me, a Sazerac, which is apparently there. Hurricanes and Sazeracs are like the New Orleans drinks, and hurricanes oh. are very fruity, and Sazeracs uh, are uh, concentrated evil. No, so what we did have it was the first day we got there uh we decided to go on bourbon street and it was like one in the afternoon so we went to i think it was maybe the one of the oldest pubs in louisiana i forgot i want to say it's even older than that like it was called uh lafitte's mm. but um we had something called a voodoo daiquiri. Interesting. And let let me read you what the recipe is based on, um, you know, someone trying to recreate it. Yes. Okay. One cup crushed ice. Okay. Two ounces of bourbon. Okay. Four ounces of grape juice. What? And one ounce of... I want to say it was like 180, 190 proof ever clear. That is the grossest thing. I that sounds like something that would get you kicked out of a college party for being too weird. <laughs> it, it, well, so you don't really taste the bourbon that much. You just taste grape and Everclear. Pretty much. Um no, it was, no it, part of that is in a daiquiri. It was surprisingly smooth, but the problem was we're walking down and you're kind of just sipping on it. Luckily, me and my wife got one of their cups to split because I'm not a big liquor person. Yeah. And uh, next thing I know, I was feeling I was feeling a little buzzed. And so like by about four o'clock, we ended up getting a beignet and just going back to the hotel and taking a nap. So that was my, you know, great first day in New Orleans. <laughs> it's getting, it's getting day buzzed and taking a nap. Yep, and definitely taking a nap. But if you've nothing else, yep, nothing else at all. But if you've never had a beignet, beignets go hard, dude. They're yeah. great. 
Yeah, I I bought a came a candy thermometer today just so I could start making beignets at home. Really? Yeah. Oh, that sounds fun. Dang, that's kind of cool. Uh, one thing that was really cool that would interest our listeners is I was able to go to the National World War II Museum. Oh, I've always wanted to go. Did I tell you what, Joey, we'll go down again sometime. Uh, okay. I, I, I'd be interested in going back. And unfortunately, we only had about two hours to go through the museum. We didn't realize they closed at like five o'clock on that day. Oh, uh, um, yeah. So we would have, you know, I would have loved to take more time to be able to really soak in everything. But my wife, who isn't a history buff by any sort of stretch, she she was very kind and was like, if this is something you really want to do, I'd be happy to go with you. I'm like, heck yeah, let's go. Let's go. Yeah. So I wanted to like get be able to get more content from there too. Like, but I guess we'll just have to go back. Yeah, dude. That oh, that would be really cool. If you guys ever do something in Louisiana, let me know. And we'll go down to <laughs> we'll go hit the World War II Museum. For sure. Be cool. Um yeah, so that was that was a really good time. That was a fun, that was a really fun wedding. Do you remember? Drew, in his infinite wisdom, picked a couple of family friends to do toasts for him. And uh, I was one of them. And uh, do you remember what I called you in front of your family and friends? I'm trying to remember the exact phrasing. Is the is a store brand pair of jeans, just so that that is, is shared with our our dear audience. It's not totally inaccurate. Well, we're doing the, you lined up the toast. And I was like, all right, here we go. And I didn't realize there were 48 of them of um, differing levels of toastability. And you don't have to comment on that because they'll be <laughs> held against you. But the one to go before me is Drew's dad, who was a preacher for a very long time. And he is sitting there playing four dimensional relationship chess in a toast. And I'm in the back, like trying to call it with knock knock jokes. <laughs> um, is just not even. I was, I I figured I would have to go funny, but I was like, all right, if you're not funny, this is going to be awful for everyone because it's not going to be any good relative to any of this mess. So, here's um, the thing, though it w- it was so nice you doing that though because it it you know again as you mentioned there was different levels of you know. Yeah, people had different approaches to their toasts. They did. Um, uh, they wrote them out about eighty percent of them, which is not something I did. <laughs> the first guy popped open a script, and or woman, I should say, not a guy. Um, and then I was like, "Oh, she wrote it out. That was smart." Then she's talking, and she flips page to page two, and I was like, "Ah, crap! <laughs> what should <laughs> Just, I do?" <laughs> like four pages. She's plowing through, and I was like, this is, I did not prepare enough. Oh, but it was nice to have, you know, my dad do something, like, kind of serious and, you know, whatever. And then to have you come and sort of, you know, lighten the mood a little bit. Yeah, that was, that's what we were trying to do. It was fun. The, um, I'm not sure, as Rachel and I have hung out, like, a couple of times, but not a lot. And I did look over at one point, and there was nothing but fear in her eyes. I don't think she knew where it was headed. And that's what you hope for in a toast. That was good. That was a good time. The um also, also the most Drew thing, they did a um, you know, how most weddings do now, where they're like people are sitting at tables and the bride and the groom are like off by themselves somewhere where everyone can stare at them. And uh me and my friends are all together and we look over and Drew at his own wedding is sipping on a cheap 12 ounce beer. Um, <laughs> is the most Drew Poplin thing I've ever seen. It was like <laughs> it might have been a Yangling, but I, I, I feel like it was it a was. PBR. It was a Yangling. Yeah, that's a little better. In my head, you're just sitting there sipping on a PBR <laughs> at your own wedding. If I thought anyone else would have appreciated a Paps Blue Ribbon, I would have just gotten that. Yeah. <laughs> no, Yangling's a good call. We did a um. We did it on a our wedding on a shoestring budget. So I had Costco beer there and no one drank it. And 
So we had, we literally had leftovers for about a year and a half and I don't drink beer. I wish I would have known you then because then maybe I, I could, I could have put a dent in that. I was about to say, because I think Costco beer is just Budweiser or something like that. It's not, you know, it is one of those. It's just re rebranded. Oh, uh, uh, good times though. It was such a fun time. Um, it was. Um, I had to wear we, a suit for the first time in forever. Yeah, that was yeah. fun. We don't talk about the first dance. Oh, the first dance was cute. Oh, really? Okay. It yeah. Came, I people have sent videos. I can't bring myself to watch it. We didn't. We didn't have time to practice it at all, and so we just improved it. And it was an upbeat song, so it wasn't like you know. With a lot of first yeah. dances, even if you don't That's practice, cool. if it's a slow song, you can just sort of work. You you sway know. yeah you do a little step to the side step to the side no one cares yeah but we felt like that'd be boring no one wants to sit and watch a bride and groom dance like slow dance for four or five minutes um, no but so uh, by the end of the first chorus i knew me and rachel didn't have much more in us so i kind of just signaled to everyone to join us at that point that's true and that's where the truly unhinged drew made an appearance that we, he survived the level of shenanigans he went through on the dance floor is nothing less than a miracle um, i would i was just proud to get people dancing and you know by the second or third song i backed out because i was like i can't do this i can't yeah. feel, my thighs are burning um i don't yeah. know if my pants are ripped at this point uh um, yeah but in the got- in the song Play that funky music, white boy, which was not a song that played, I don't think. But he was both the funky music and the white boy. <laughs> um, he went so like we're literally watching him dance and we're like, he's going to try to stand up and fall over. <laughs> like, <laughs> the sweat dripping down his face. <laughs> I was drenched, man. It was bad. Yeah, it was really fun, though. I'm not much of a dancer, but it was good. I was. I think we did it uh, a fair amount of, of justice. And we hope that you have a wonderful, uh, wonderful marriage, of course, um, you. that you're in Asheville sucks royally because that is real far away from from where I happen to be located. But Asheville has the best restaurants on the planet. So I have an excuse to go there. I do have some Drew's clues, by the way, if we want some fire. Oh, yes. Let's do it. So if y'all remember way back in the day when we last posted, um, we I had I, I didn't have gray hair then. <laughs> um, I did a firearms manufacturer or, you know, inventor instead of a particular firearm and that answer was parker so charles parker and the parker brothers that line of firearms now this week this double barrel shotgun was first marketed in 1930 known for its high production costs and low sales but it was also known for being extremely well made it was a favorite of former general and president of the United States, Dwight Eisenhower. What firearm really? am I talking about? I don't know. That's interesting. He blanked me on that one. I don't even sort of have a guess. That'll be a fun one. If you guys know the answer, no peeking, send in the answer to marketing at sdi.edu. Uh, if you are first, we will send you some swag. If you also, we publish these on YouTube. Uh, if you're on the YouTube channel, you find this video. This uh, It's called an audiogram. It's a video where the podcast is. Uh, stick a comment on there, and uh, we will uh, we'll get to you if you happen to be first. And if not, we'll still give you a shout out. And uh, good luck, guys. That's a, that's a deep dive. It's a deep cut, I think, is what the youngsters say now. Oh, I also have a fun Easter egg for you. Ladies mm-hmm. and gentlemen, I need your your citizen of the world participation. I need your cosmopolitan mindset. I need you to take a journey with me across the seas of the internet. Um, The Oxford English Dictionary has opened its word of the year voting. 
Ooh. And the three words that are in the short list. There, well, it's really three phrases because only one of these is is one single word. Sure. Um, the three words are metaverse, bleh, hashtag, I stand with, and far, far more importantly, goblin mode is the third candidate for Oxford Dictionary's Word of the Year. People, get on the <laughs> internet right now. Are you in a shower? Are you listening to us in the shower? Get out of the shower. Dry your your still unclean hands crack open that laptop and vote right now if you're in a car pull over to your nearest dollar general ignore the guy out front asking you if if you want to buy his used cell phone and you type in goblin mode on the phone that you have that currently works you do it right now activate goblin mode as a set as a mindset right Mm. and uh it's it's time people lock in this is We've never used the collective might of the Gunwreck Mafia before, but now is the time. We gotta win this thing. We just don't let cause... Metaverse win. That's a Zuckerberg thing. There's two reasons here. One, Goblin Mode is objectively <laughs> glorious. Second of all, Metaverse being an Oxford Dictionary word of the year is just free advertising. And I'm not even sure it's free. I feel like mm. that's something that they would pay to try and make a thing because their VR platform's not working at all. Lock in for Goblin Mode. Okay, so that's that's Drew's side of things. The significantly more important side of things. Uh, but I probably could have gotten another episode out even without Drew's help and somehow without, I mean, Podbean really put a damper on things. There's not much I could do about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I'm also in the middle of moving, which we're going to talk a little less about because we know we've been chatting for a while. But the the housing market is changing, as I'm sure you guys know, pretty rapidly, thanks to a uh, the Fed changing interest rates at a at a speed that can only be termed as uh, childish. Um, They it's. It's not reasonable at any level. And the Fed is not a um, not an elected position. So I think I can say that uh, without it being too politicky. But either way, it's my opinion. And uh, but they are single handedly ruining the housing market. And that is largely on purpose. They're trying to slow down the economy to get a handle on rampant inflation. And one of the ways they can do that is by changing the housing market drastically. So my wife and I have been not thrilled with our house. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, you know, it's a great house. It's just not the right. My wife uh, commutes like an hour for work. It's just not a, you know, it's just not the exact right fit for us. We're also, you know, we'll expand in the not too distant future. And I work from home, which means you need more space, yada, yada, yada. So we are like, we're going to sell this house well, we still have equity that's sizable, right? And and we still do, even with the market being wonky. Um, but involved in that is you have to take this house that you have customized and made your own and turn it into a broad appeal, mass marketing, you know, blahville situation. And uh, we have two dogs. We have three cats. And uh, because of that... We have, first of all, we need somewhere for there to be. Fortunately, my parents are in town and have what is functionally a mother-in-law suite. Our poor animals are staying on the back porch that's screened in and climate controlled. And uh, we got to commute to our house, which is 35 minutes away from my parents' house, uh, multiple times a day, every day, separately, because we have different work schedules. Um, There were... You have to, obviously, you need to move things out and pack them, right? That's part one. And then part two is you need to clean everything thoroughly because, first of all, um, you're about to do home improvements. And second of all, it's just a good thing to do if you're for potential buyers. But when you have animals, cleaning means pet odors and dander and hair 
literally for days on end. Uh, there was one night I spent an all nighter just sweeping up hair. Um, because you, you wipe out that big clump that you've been ignoring for forever. And then you have to go individual hair by hair across an entire household because you want, some people don't like pets at all and they don't want to think about pets when they walk into your house. So you want it to be exactly right for them. And, uh, that's how you do it. But there were multiple full 24 hour days where I was in that house working without a break, um, to get that thing going. I had some wonderful friends volunteer to help out. We repainted almost everything. We put in some drywall. We repaired some stuff. We put in some quarter round. We actually, I mean, the house is literally in the best shape it's ever been in since we've owned it because we wanted to get it right for sellers and we want it to look right, nice and we want people to be happy. And that stuff doesn't cost too much money. We essentially remodeled our entire, not remodeled, but we put an entire fresh face on our house for about 2500 bucks which is not not terrible yeah and that's including everything and uh it's also including the massive quantities of beer and hard lemonade and hard seltzer i had to farm out to people to get them to come by but we did all that we worked real hard and uh we put the house on the market and the housing market being what it is it's sitting despite the fact that everything is right there is nothing wrong with the house that we're aware of. We did. I think we had to replace the bathtub, but we're, you know, that's something we're including if we, you know, get a competitive offer. I don't know why I'm adding that, but the, uh, it's, it's a solid house on more than two acres of land, which in the area I'm in is borderline unheard of. But uh, the market is so slow that even though our house is priced better, it's not even competitive. It just is better. Then every comparable thing in a many mile radius is just not going. And we put in an offer on a house. Wow, house. What, where am I from? Oh, we put an offer in on a house, and uh, that offer got accepted. And if you've bought a house before, um, there are things not bought a house before. There are things called due diligence and earnest money. Due diligence is what you put down when you get that uh, offer to purchase countersigned by the sellers. And basically is you putting money down saying, we are going to functionally rent your house. You don't take possession of it, but you can put inspectors in there and you get the appraiser in, yada, yada, yada. You figure out what's wrong with the house and you want to make sure that the house is still worth what you're paying for it. And the bank wants to figure that out too. That's due diligence. Then you have earnest money, which you put in after that on the assumption that the inspections go how you want them to go and concessions go how you want them to go, et cetera, et cetera. All that is to say, we put an offer in and it was accepted and we put due diligence down and we got inspections and we're going to lose all that money because the, um, the, our house is not moving uh, despite, I mean, I've been working in marketing a long time. There's a lot of market analysis on this and uh, it should, there's no reason it should not be moving, but it's not. And um, very frustrating, I'll be honest with you. That's taken up most of my time. And of course, I'm staying with my parents, which is very nice of them, but you're, you're, you're putting people out for weeks on end and that's, you know, not a great thing. Thank goodness they did too, because most people that buy and sell houses, they have to time everything absolutely perfectly. If we had to do that, we already would have failed. So for now, we get to sit while that's on the market. And I literally at one point, this is wildly irresponsible, don't ever do this. Um, But there is an episode two years ago, I think, where I told you guys that I herniated a disc in my back, which is kind of a long running joke amongst my friends. But when you herniate a disc in your back, it takes a while to recover. But more than that, there's like a 90 something percent chance that you re-aggravate that disc. And the ways you do that are lifting things improperly unhealthy you know if you gain weight you're more susceptible that kind of thing you know anything else stress your back you know is not is going to put it in the wrong place now i've dropped 45 pounds since that happened and that's largely taking care of the issue because there's less just general wear and tear every waking second of you know the day but uh because i was moving so much crap around and by crap i mean everything i know and love yes um I re-aggravated my disc very quickly. I contacted my doctor and I was like, hey, 
because prednisone is generally what you use to, to reduce the inflammation for that kind of thing. And if you've never had prednisone, it's a steroid that's a very, very strong. They generally control its dispersal because it is a, uh, along with being an anti-inflammatory, it is a hyper stimulant. Um, and uh, don't ever drink coffee and do it at the same time. You will be, uh, you will get panic attacks. But I called them. I was like, listen, I did this. And they were like, well, stop doing that and you'll be cool. I was like, I'm in the middle of moving. She's like, all right, fine. I'm going to give you this <laughs> the anti-inflammatory drugs, but you have to stop moving as soon as you can. I was like, all right, fine. So basically I re-aggravated my disc and then oh, took medication cool. prescribed by a doctor to ignore the aggravation on my disc for about two weeks, which is not what you're supposed to do. But I did do that. So, yeah. Drew had a wonderful couple of weeks that are stressful. I've had a stressful couple of weeks that are stressful, but both of us are happy to be here with you now. And again, we are sorry. This was, there was a genuine attempt in creation of an episode that was supposed to launch a week ago and Podbean, which is our, I'm sorry, I should have said this first time. Podbean is our server that we publish episodes through. And they just locked us out. They, we could mm-hmm. not publish the episode. So hopefully this one will go through without any issues. I think Drew's side I, of things are easier than mine. Yeah, and, I was uh, locked out too. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, for uh, that 24 hours. So Joey sent me the episode to try to post. Yeah, it was like, well, I can't get it. Really? I, uh, yeah. But... Which is weird because you know we've had a pretty good experience with Podbean. Oh, Podbean is great, and I still think they're great. I have, this yeah. is the first issue at all I've had with them, and we've been using them for more than three years. So mm-hmm. I'll take that. One yeah. snag in three years is okay, especially yeah. at the price point they operate at. Yeah, all that to say is, guys, thank you so much for uh, bearing with us, being patient. We've had a lot going on, and we hope things in your life are going okay. We hope. That it is, yeah. The, it's the wonderful kind of stressful weeks for y'all. Yeah, we missed Veterans Day and we missed Thanksgiving. I will combine the two by saying we are very thankful for our veterans. We we appreciate all you got, both our listeners and our veterans out there. We cannot thank you enough for downloading this and also, you know, protecting our freedom. Uh, I'll let you decide which is tied to which uh, segment. But um, this is also a little bit cathartic, I think, for both Drew and myself, just being able to talk about the massive life changes yeah. going on right now. But and frankly, me and Joey haven't had time to catch up since the wedding, pretty much. Yeah, since he got married. So that's been solid. But now let's talk about some gun stuff. We got yes. the time. It's gun time. We have some stuff that we are pretty excited. We're going to wrap up. We uh, our last episode we talked about Joey's got a brand new gun. I think the title was. I picked up a new firearm. It was sweet. It is sweet. I didn't get rid of it. And um, it has been uh, since then. I've been carrying it. It's been a joy to carry, and I've been carrying it almost exclusively outside the waistband, which is not normally my bag. But so far, it's working. I'll get it inside the waistband soon. But this is what I had available, and uh, it's gone well. But I think when we last left you guys, we were down to the Smith & Wesson CSX and the Sig Sauer P365XL. There are a lot of different variants of the 365. The XL specifically has, I believe, two more rounds. I think it's 12 plus one and about a three and a half inch barrel, maybe a touch longer. And the uh, CSX has a 10 and 12 round capacity. Uh, you're going to want to do the 12 round on that one. and. Um, I think it's a 3.1 inch barrel, but I'm doing all of that off the top of my head. Um, so when I went to the store, um, I had one gun in month, and that was the Smith and Wesson CSX. I was stoked about it. It is tiny. Um, it is a. It's basically the tiniest version of a 1911 that features a double digit capacity nine millimeter stack and a half magazine uh single action only people really like the trigger um manual safety which not everybody's into but i really like 
and uh, Drew and I both, I think, shot it at the range at the gathering day from yeah, at the gathering, uh, which is Palmetto State Armory's range day, and um, we both had a blast, no pun intended, and uh, we really liked it. And so I was like, I am so stoked to get this. I'd been waiting for months. Um, I was like, when I have money, I'm going to get the CSX. And I went to the store. So I picked up the CSX and I had them start the papers for it. And um, they they give you, you know, there's the one in the display case. And then most of the time with a new firearm, they have the one that you get is generally not the one in the case, right? They have an, uh, a collection of them in the back that they pull out mm-hmm. and they let you inspect the one that you are going to use to the one that you're going to purchase yeah um so that you can okay that because there's very you know there's almost literally never a return policy for this kind of thing and i picked up the csx and the one that they let me hold in the display case had a trigger guard on it which makes sense and uh, the one that they gave me didn't and i cleared it magazine was empty chamber was empty and I pulled the trick, I dry fired it in the store and I hated it. I hated the way it broke. Um, just did not feel right on any level. And most people love it. This is not a ding on Smith and Wesson. It just did not vibe with me. And I'm, I technically, you're not supposed to do that. Or at least according to Academy store policy, you're not allowed to do that. Um, which is where I picked this thing up. I don't know if that was a specific store policy. They, they didn't seem too mad about it, but I'm so glad I did because if I bought that thing and uh, I just wouldn't have been happy with it. Yeah. So uh, it was also, it's a very short grip on that thing. And um, my very large hands did not quite fit the, um, my pinky was hanging on for dear life with the 12 round magazine, which is just a hair longer. It just didn't work like I was hoping it would. So I pivoted over. I asked them to stop and move to the 365 XL. And uh, they, they uh, I thought they were going to be mad at me. They weren't. They were super cool with it. They let me do the same thing with the 365. They let me dry fire that. Again, magazine was out. Chamber was empty. And none of these things are pointed in an unsafe direction at all. And that trigger broke. And I was like, okay, this is it. It's. I used to have a 320. And I enjoyed that firearm. The only it was too big for concealed carry, in my opinion, which is why I got rid of it. And uh, this trigger reminded me of that one quite a bit. I don't know if that's just a SIG thing or if I'm just remembering <laughs> to, to it was seven years ago, or I think it was eight years ago now. Nope, six years ago. I'm dumb. Uh, I don't know, but I no, it was seven years ago. This totally does not matter. It reminded me of that, and I really enjoyed it. So I picked up the 365 XL. I think there was $50 of difference in price. It was a little over 600 bucks. I think, walking out the door, which is actually more than I have spent on any firearm outside of my Galil Ace ever. But I wanted something that I would carry, and then that was it. That's my concealed carry mm-hmm. for, from now on. And I think this has a really good chance of being that. It's so small. It's so slim. It's so nice, but it still fits my large hands. 12 plus 1 capacity is so good. Barrel length is right. And uh, currently I'm carrying it out. I'm waiting to get a holster Mm -hmm. for inside the waistband. And I had, and I'm so ashamed of this, my grandfather, as some holiday gift, gave me a universal fit outside the waistband holster in i don't even know if it's kydex like a plasticky thing and i was like this is the dumbest thing i've ever seen because those things like they don't have a reputation for being good sure and uh i was like i don't know because i have a bunch of commander like 1911 stuff and i was like that might work um and they don't even a little bit And I was like, well, crap, what am I going to, you know, I have this new concealed carry gun and I want to get, um, I want to get a nice holster for it. And sometimes that takes time because a lot of these places are in back order. And, uh, in the meantime, there's this stupid universal carrier 
um, I forget the brand, and it clicked and worked like a charm. It's absolutely perfect. It's like maybe the best holster I've ever used. <laughs> um, it's just absolutely, it's amazing. Um, and I wear it with a light jacket. Um, and th- it that's it. That does it. It's, I mean, outside the waistband, it prints less than any other firearm I've ever used. It's ridiculous. Wow. It's so good. Perhaps a grandpa. So choice. Um, I have successfully concealed carried it under a denim shirt. Um, just a rare old denim shirt. And uh, or outside the waistband, that is pretty darn good. Mm. So huge props to that. Whenever I look at that holster next, I'll find the brand and share it with you guys. But that's how good not only that is, but the 365 XL is for concealability. They figured out what they wanted to make. And uh, they just freaking nailed it because that's what SIG does a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, they make good stuff. Uh, I was surprised SIG. I've, this is my third SIG I've owned, but none of them, the 33, excuse me, the P320 I bought on purpose, um, sort of. I wanted to get a Jericho 941, and my grandfather, who's a very firearms guy, told me not to get that and to get a striker fired gun instead. I ended up with a P320. I ended up selling it because it was not concealable, in my opinion. So I know plenty of people that do it just fine. I ended up with a Sig Sauer C3, which is a Commander 1911 with officer-length grit. Um, and I got that because it was an incredible deal. Also not on purpose. It's my first 45 handgun uh, I own. It's probably going to be the last, but I'm not getting rid of it because it's a great quality firearm. And then this one I literally picked up at the at the 11th hour because the smith and wesson i wanted did not uh did not meet my hopes and dreams so i now have had three sags two of which i still own and none of which i really intended to own more than about a week before i got them yeah so a fun journey but the three p365 xl i'm gonna put um a couple hundred rounds through it and uh, do a little break in and uh, tell you guys how that shoots. Pretty excited for that. So that'll be in the not too distant future at all. Um, I might even be able to get it out this month. We cannot wait to hear about that. That'll be fun. And I can't wait to go to the range again with you, buddy. Been too long. Yeah. Has been a long time. All right, folks. This has actually been a pretty long episode of the gun rack. But thank you guys for listening. We hope you enjoyed the, the firearms part of this. And... Uh, Hopefully the rest of it uh, will eat up some time at your place of work or as you're driving, or it will uh, fill out your bingo chart of all the gun rack mafia listeners for cliches for us. I think the only thing we didn't say today was not an official STI opinion, which I did just now. So bingo, I guess. Yep. But for now, folks, that is the gun rack. We will be back next week for sure. We promise. Stay safe out there, and we will see you at the range. The Noran Desert Institute is an online school accredited by the DEAC. It is headquartered at 1555 West University Drive in Tempe, Arizona. For more information about how you can craft your firearms future, visit sdi.edu.